Afternoon, welcome. everyone. Yes, welcome. <laughs> so during the uh, Bishop's Ranch planning meeting, while I was trying to um, get out of giving a talk, I don't remember who it was that suggested that Aaron and I do a dialogue. And it just seemed, seemed like an opportunity that I didn't want to pass up. So we agreed to do a dialogue not knowing what we were going to talk about yet. And right. over the course of the last few days, we zeroed in on a topic, uh, the nature of consciousness and what to do about it. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to get us started by talking a little bit about the study of consciousness. And then um, Aaron will sort of pick up that thread and uh, try to uh, bring us toward um, some of the pragmatic or practical or practice-oriented applications of these theories of consciousness. Mm. And then we'll, we'll engage from there and hopefully have a, a rich dialogue with everyone. Okay. So as an undergrad, I studied cognitive science. And I was lucky enough to not only be exposed to sort of the mainstream paradigm, which is more um, focused on what, what are called computational approaches to understanding cognition um, and thought where the human mind is analogized to a computer system, the brain is the hardware, the mind is the software. Um, and this is tied into artificial intelligence research and, and whatnot. But I was also exposed as an undergrad to the phenomenological approach. And the important difference is that for phenomenologists, human experience is, um, is at the center of the inquiry. And for the computational approach to studying cognition, human experience is irrelevant because um, that mainstream paradigm is based on the more, um, the view of science that it's studying and trying to objectify uh, something that's separate from the subject. And so to study consciousness where in a way that we would take seriously human experience is kind of forbidden. Um, it breaks the rules of what scientific inquiry is normally considered to be. But I'm grateful that I had some professors that exposed me to the phenomenological tradition, and in particular, Francisco Varela and Evan Thompson, who together with uh, another cognitive scientist or cognitive psychologist, Eleanor Roche, wrote a book in 1993 called The Embodied Mind. And in this book, they explored the relationship between the neurosciences, cognitive science, and phenomenology, as well as certain um, Buddhist philosophical traditions and made the case that uh, both Buddhist contemplative practice and phenomenology, this school of thought coming out of um, I guess Immanuel Kant's transcendentalism and then Husserl and Heidegger and Merleau-Ponty, mm -hmm. um, that these more philosophical traditions had something to say to neuroscience and to cognitive science about the nature of uh, cognition and consciousness. So um, Evan Thompson uh, was recently in, at UC Berkeley giving a mm -hmm. series of seminars and talks. And Aaron and I both caught different um, talks that he gave mm -hmm. um, on, on a related set of topics. And um, Thompson has been in debate with uh, other cognitive scientists who are trying to naturalize uh, consciousness, by which is meant um, to try to explain consciousness based on uh, brain activity. And one of the main um, approaches in this, uh, you know, one of the main ways that consciousness can be naturalized is by looking for neural correlates of consciousness, mm -hmm. which is the idea that there's some definable uh, brain region that through fMRI scans or PET scans or other brain scanning technology that can be pinpointed and uh, correlated with a subjectively reported experience. Um, and that this is sort of the, the thread that those neuroscientists and cognitive scientists trying to naturalize consciousness are trying to follow. And Evan Thompson uh, and other colleagues of his, like Alvin Noe, who's also, he's, he's at Berkeley. Thompson's actually located up at um, another UC, uh, or sorry, UBC, University mm -hmm. of British Columbia, not uh, um, UC Berkeley, but he's giving a, a guest, series of guest lectures at UC Berkeley this past several weeks. Um, and Thompson and Noe have criticized the neural correlates approach um, because for them, consciousness is uh, 
it's not located somewhere in the skull. It's an embodied activity, and it's thinking is not just theoretical for them. It's also tied to the way that we uh, are in the world. It's tied to our action. Uh, it's, it's tied to um, our intentions and our attention. And to try to um, sort of capture it in a freeze frame fMRI scan is to sort of uh, misunderstand the phenomenon that, that we're even trying to understand in the first place. So um, the naturalization approach, I think, and I agree with Thompson here, is kind of um, off target. Consciousness is not just another object that we can study scientifically. Uh, there's obviously a subjective dimension to it. And so what Thompson has tried to articulate is what he calls a neurophenomenological approach, where we would um, try to cultivate our inner experience using both contemplative techniques, which oftentimes are uh, coming out of Buddhist traditions, and also um, Western phenomenological techniques. And through the cultivation of experience and in dialogue with neuroscientists and their brain scanners, um, try to come to a, a deeper understanding of the intersection of our interior experience and these exterior measurements without privileging one side or the other as um, more fundamental or more explanatory, more um, um, causally fundamental or more where one side would be explanatory of the other side. And I've always found that this approach is, um, you know, the phenomenological <laughs> approach to studying consciousness is a mm, pretty knockdown argument against any reductionistic attempt uh, to explain consciousness by reference to brain processes. Because what Thompson will point out is that, at least epistemologically speaking, consciousness is primary. All of our scientific descriptions and research uh, is taking place within the context of, or it presupposes, a conscious subject who's doing that research, doing that observation. And so the methods of inquiry that scientists um, practice presuppose consciousness. So to try to explain consciousness when your methods already presuppose it is just foolhardy. Um, so it's a great check on those who would attempt to reduce consciousness to the brain, but I've argued from um, a Whiteheadian perspective that it's kind of ontologically underdetermined and that it leaves a lot um, of questions to be asked about consciousness's place in the universe. So the phenomenologist will articulate the structure of consciousness as having um, a horizontal character. Mm -hmm. So that rather than the naturalist who will say that consciousness is a problem that can be solved, the phenomenologist looks at consciousness more as a mystery to be experienced or lived. So that it has a horizontal structure means that the more we try to approach it, if we objectify it, the more it recedes away from us, right? Just like when you walk towards the horizon, it's not like the horizon gets closer to you. So there's this receding edge. The more we think we're understanding it, the more the mystery continues to recede fr from us. And I think what the panpsychist perspective uh, adds to this is that um, rather than having to say that we don't know what's on the other side of that horizon of consciousness, it's, it's more like um, what's on the other side of that horizon of consciousness is consciousness. Is in, in other words, other consciousness is looking back at us, and that consciousness is fundamentally intersubjective. Or a whole new you. A whole new you, perhaps. Um, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Sorry, implementation is, is coming. Yeah. So there's the naturalist approach, the transcendentalist approach, and the panpsychist approach. And these different angles on asking what consciousness is, what its nature is, I think have certain um, practical implications mm. for our contemplative practice, mm -hmm. for our uh, pedagogical uh, endeavors, for mm -hmm. politics, for art. Yeah. Um, you want to jump in there and, and offer sure. a um, bit from your side of things? Sure. So um, Evan Thompson and his colleagues represent what's called an inactivist approach to the study of cognition and consciousness, which understands consciousness as a process that has the world and the kind of organism's response to it as its ground. So that's part of why finding neurological correlates to consciousness is, in a way, sort of 
um, insufficient to addressing the profundity of the question, which is the whole fluid dance of our organismic response to the world. That's really what's at stake in the question of consciousness. Uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty said, uh, the, the body-mind is an open circuit completed by the world. And that's a very kind of an activist or a proto-inactivist sensibility. You, another way you could describe it as, is as dialectical. There's a couple of biologists, Richard Levins and Richard Lewinton. They wrote a book called The Dialectical Biologist. Um, and they said, uh, these are the properties of things we call dialectical. That one thing cannot exist without the other, that one acquires its properties from its relation to the other, that the properties of both evolve as a consequence of their interpenetration. And so inactivism involves a kind of dialectical understanding of consciousness in relation to what we may be conscious of and searches for its essence in that sort of nexus. I would like to add something to that. Um, I think another aspect of dialectical thinking is to recognize that any particular node in a web of relationships can be understood as a product of that web of relationships, or it can be understood as a subject of that web of relationships. It is a producer of it, and it is produced by it. And dialectical methodology involves a studied um, ability to suspend whether you land on that node as one or the other of those poles, right? Um, and so um, we can talk about um, sort of the hard problem, which is sort of how do you derive first-person accounts from third-person accounts? Um, and then that raises this impossible question, what is consciousness? On the other hand, at the, around the fire last night, somebody said to me, what is consciousness? And I said, if you want to know what consciousness is, all you have to do is wake up, um, which I think uh, kind of has some nice echoes to it, that sentence. Um, OK. so. Another point that I wanted to make, though, I use this word subject. Um, and I think it's important to remember that consciousness isn't the same as the subject, meaning my sense of, of what I am or who I am. Um, what we're talking about here is something more like, how is it that I even have access to my internal states? So there's a, a term from the Yogacara school of Buddhism. It's called Swasamvedana, SVA. S-A-M-V-E-D-A-N-A, Swasamvedana. And it refers to a kind of self-apprehension. It's a moment that with each sensory event, the apprehension of Matt sitting here, there is a secondary one, which is my awareness that I am aware of that. And that has to do with our access to our own subjective states. OK, so that Swasamvedana is at, is occurring at the level of this organismic response to the overall environment. And the wager that I'm trying to make here is that we can actually exercise ourselves at that level. So it's something different from a kind of psychotherapeutic process of reflection. It's a little bit more akin to something like a martial arts training or weightlifting or something, where that actual kind of deep organismic, maybe instinctual response to the environment that we can call swasam vedana. This, by the way, is a term that Evan Thompson really likes, um, and it's, it matches in with his own scientific work. That can actually be kind of empowered and moved like a muscle. Now, I, I think that's actually pretty amazing. Um, it's possible through actions that we undertake to exercise the ground of what we are. This is what I was referring to when I used this word autoplasticity last night. Um, reading Kant and other sort of transcendental thinkers who think about what are the conditions of possibility such that experience arises? OK, that's a profound question. What interests me as a kind of magician is what is the degree of my sort of wherewithal with regard to those transcendental factors? Um, is there some negotiability there? Is there some ability that we have recursively in this sort of transcendental context? And um, I, don't, I think that where this kind of comes in a lot is in taking a look at how we relate to our repeated actions and our habituated responses to the environment. So a theme that we were talking about before is the importance of habit in this context. 
And so the practices that we undertake that maybe empower our swasam vedana, et cetera, have to do with our relationship to habits and how that over time sort of forms us as subjects. So I, this isn't just me talking. We can talk a little bit more about what this means sort of politically and artistically, et cetera. Um, but in terms of the cog sci issues about the hard problem and such, I'm kind of, I don't know, I'm sort of just a spectator to that in a sense. I don't feel like it's the what to do about it question may not require one or another answer to the hard problem. I'm not sure about that. So I might need to think a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. um, so how are we doing, Matt? What do you think about well, what I just said there? I remember, I remember a few years ago I gave, I gave a talk about um, the, the, where we're at in terms of understanding consciousness right now is that there's two roads we could follow. Either we accept panpsychism, two roads because of the hard problem, right. the framing of that problem. How does first person experience arise out of third person brain mm -hmm. processes, physiological processes? And that once that question has been framed, either we accept that all um, physical processes are in some sense um, sentient or experiential, and that's panpsychism, right. or we accept the eliminative materialist eliminative, position, yeah. which is that when we talk about anything, first person, consciousness, feelings, emotions, qualitative uh, experience of, of sounds and textures and colors, we're, we're hallucinating or thinking, we're mistaking words for something um, that has an ontological nature when really mm -hmm. um, there isn't any consciousness. It's just right. a way of speaking. Yeah. And um, we have to accept that it's all just physical processes. Now, just want to remark, that's not a kind of reductionism that's important for folks to recognize, that reductionism would, would mean that it's possible in principle to translate from our ordinary talk about consciousness right. and volition to the discourse of the hard sciences in a kind of third person right. perspective. So you could still say conscious, as a reductionist, you yeah. could say consciousness is has correlates e and epiphenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe consciousness, it's real, it's there, but it has no effect on your behavior. Yeah. It has no causal influence on the world, but it's still there. Whereas eliminativism would say there is no need to appeal to these terms, consciousness and volition. They right. are not well formed. And they so have no cognitive meaning. Right. And so I had, in this talk a few years ago, chosen the panpsychist route yeah. and tried to unpack its ethical implications and, to, and argue that um, in order to recognize non human agency, non human value, that panpsychism is the way to go. And you, you were pointing out that um, if the project is to decenter the human, Mm -hmm. and uh, recognize the importance of all these non-human processes that eliminativism might actually get us to the same place. Mm -hmm. it, perhaps even more profoundly than uh, panpsychism can. Yeah. Sure. And there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a cognitive scientist named Thomas Metzinger mm -hmm. who um, I think could be characterized as an eliminativist, mm -hmm. and he's also a, a Buddhist, I believe. He is, yeah. And or of some sort, he does practice. Right, so his idea is that through meditative practice, we could actually come to uh, cultivate the insight that the eliminativists are um, arguing for, that it's not so much an argument as it is an experiential realization that we could realize through practice. Yeah, so let's give an example of that. Um, now, um, we, I generally have a kind of vaguely felt sense of what I am. I, I kind of have a, some sense that I'm feeling a mind, like if you say your mind. I kind of feel that, right? I mean, do you kind of? Um, but um, my teachers have encouraged me to really kind of shut the door and get quiet and settle down and um, really look for that. Try to identify it. What are its factors? Where is it, where is it located? <coughs> Does it have a color or a shape? Um, is it somewhere in my body? Where does it seem to reside? Okay, once I zero in, maybe it's here. All right, where, where, what are its parts and characteristics? And you, as you continue to kind of do that, eventually it, you start to realize, no, none of that was actually my mind or me. It, it, can't, it kind of dissipates the sense of the self or the mind and its edges and contours and boundaries kind of dissipates. And there's this sense of 
just a kind of vivid spaciousness that opens up. And now, so when we talk about no self, it's not, um, it might be eliminativist in a strictly kind of linguistic game kind of thing. But what's at stake here is that sort of practice of this profound, vivid, sentient spaciousness that opens up that can't be characterized as anything whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And by making that kind of discovery, which I can only make in terms of my own swasamvedana, my own access to my interior states, yeah. what I was grasping at as my identity turns out not to be something stable at all. So I, it turns out I have a kind of abyssal nature. But, but that doesn't just mean that there's just a void when I go looking for myself. I think part of what it means is that there is a flow and a flux. There is this kind of dialectical sort of happening that's there between these realms of interior, or seemingly interior and exterior factors. And by continuing to exercise, let's say, at the level of this swasam vedana, at the level of the bare access to whatever could be later characterized as subject or object, interior or exterior, by making that a habit, by, by habituating myself at a level that I didn't even realize existed until you know, I had these little glimpses, by habituating to that, whole new kinds of subjectivity become possible. What I mean by that is whole, whole new kinds of social interaction, a whole new capacity for improvisation, a whole new openness to what other people are going through and coping with. And so this is where sort of compassion enters into it. Mm -hmm. And this is important insofar as our political, socio-political economic kind of embeddedness is a project or a process of subjectivation. We are subject to these various political and economic and cultural forces, both in that sense of being kind of held to its laws and identified as citizens and all those kinds of things, but we are actually constructed as these identities that we have. And that turns out to be kind of an engine for um, shared values like war and consumerism mm -hmm. and all of these sorts of things. So b having the ability within our own organism to exercise the foundations of our own consciousness gives us a kind of handle on, the, on our process of subjectivation. We become participant in this process of being constructed by our surroundings. Right. So this is why I'm I use the language of autoplasticity instead of simply autopoiesis which sounds like it's giving me too much control. I'm not mm -hmm. able to just kind of generate a new arm. Right. You know, there are certain like natural limits to it, but there is a plasticity to this process. Right. And it's quite open-ended. So it becomes a kind of work of art. One's life becomes an ongoing work of art mm -hmm. in this context that has political ramifications, I think. Yeah. What do you think? So I want to hear from everyone else, but just to, the take home for me is Consciousness is not an object that we can study in a naturalistic way. Sure. Consciousness is a, well, it's the means through which we, we know okay. anything Yeah, else. that too. It's the means through which we know anything else. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. And it can be cultivated, it can be transformed. Uh, we can learn new means through which mm -hmm. to know things. Yeah. Um, and there are political implications for this because we're constantly um, entering into relationships of um, mutual construction with one another. We find yeah. ourselves in that flux of Rather than, subjective you know, the, the sort of liberal political theory that Western civilization, modern Western civilization is based around is the idea that we are individuals first and we enter into a contract, a social contract. Right. Um, whereas with, I think the perspective we're articulating here mm -hmm. is suggesting is that, no, actually, we create each other's individuality in community with one another. Mm -hmm. And so our, our politics needs to reflect that, yeah. um, rather than assuming that we begin as individuals and then enter in, into society. Mm -hmm. uh, both are happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. We're constructing our individuality in society. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a form of, of artistic uh, of production. Poet, of, yeah, it's a um, or something. You know, Ashton men mentioned uh, Joseph Beuys earlier, this um, mm. German artist and, and activist, and he talked about social sculpture, and I think it's, yeah. know, it's another way of looking at sort of the other side of autoplasticity. Mm -hmm. It's the intersubjective side mm -hmm. of autoplasticity, which is looking more at how individual subjects can become aware of their own conscious activity and um, transform mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. We also do that in conjunction with others. Certainly, yeah. yeah. So, 
Any last word, or should we, should we see what? There's just two very basic ways that you can exercise this, and one is to concentrate one's attention and like really settle the mind, and there's a discovery of states of peace, yeah. quiet, a kind of sinking, but a careful, eventually very precise attentiveness. And on the other hand, there is the relaxation of that single-pointed attention into a kind of panoramic receptivity. And so those are the two sorts of wings of meditation practice, which underlie all of the various kinds of dharma practices that you'll find in Buddhist traditions. The first one is called shamatha, the second vipassana. So it's that calm abiding and then sort of panoramic vision. And those just basic kind of things, establishing that as a habit empowers our organismic instinctual level swasam vedana, which opens out all new possibilities for what we can become. Thanks, Aaron. Go ahead. Um, it was interesting because I think what you refer to as the abyssal nature of self, yeah. I might call, like, I relate to it as the mandala, the mandalic nexus of everything. Okay. So for me, understanding that change is constant. Mm -hmm doesn't necessarily take away my experience of self because I'm still a nexus. Mm -hmm. I'm still a location through which life is living herself. And so it's difficult for me. I mean, I, I understand the no self concept in reference to everything as constant change and I'm not a noun, I'm a verb. But, it's, but the nothing doesn't make sense to me because I'm constantly experiencing this mandala of yeah. nexus. Yeah. That's happening at all points in time. Sure. So I'm curious. And I think the work of art plays into that. Yeah. So I'm just curious. Well, it's important to remember that um, this is not intended simply to be a language game, but refers it itself again and again to a community of practitioners who, when they're not in discourse, either in writing or debate or whatever, are in these processes of contemplative uh, cultivation. And so I was trying to say that the nothing sparkles. It's not that I discover that I am nothing. It's that I go looking for what I thought I was, and it turns out that wasn't it. And you just keep persisting in that. And then it becomes less important that you are anything in particular. And this whole notion that, in turn, that there might not be a self becomes less and less threatening because there is this sparkling, shining wisdom, which is just the spontaneous nature. Mm -hmm. It's uncontrived. It's what happens when contrivances come to an end. And then, sure, that's mandala. Yeah. Mm. Monica. What, you, what you're, you are talking about here, um, <coughs> autoplasticity, mm -hmm. resonates completely with what Brian is working on with autocosmology. Oh, cool. Uh -huh. um, and one way to think about this is that, like, in co cosmologically, if we look out at the star or the background radiation originally, we're looking at that which gave birth to what is looking out. Sure, yeah. But also, that may be like a linear time, okay. and it may be a real uh, linear version of the more relative uh, or the more general. When we look out at one another, we're looking at that which gives birth to what is looking mm -hmm. out yeah. um, within the heartland yeah. of time. Yeah. yeah. It's beautiful. Thanks for that. I like that. Uh -huh. I like what you guys <laughs> just talked about. Yeah. Yeah. So we had Laura, Deepak, and Julian. <laughs> uh, kind, of, kind of bringing that back out, um, coming around to kind of what one was saying, but I think in terms of like neuroscience, what I've learned is I can't cite anything about where I where I read this, but I remember hearing something along the lines of the, there's like a delay, right, in like our brain kind of processing information, and it's like nanoseconds, but mm -hmm. yeah. it kind of like results in the reality that our brain is sort of like anticipating, right, and kind of like fortune telling in any given moment, and like we're always trying to figure out and be a step ahead, and I just think it's kind of interesting to think in terms of like what we're creating in these like nanoseconds, in these like quantum kind of fields, like mm -hmm. we're calling these in at any given moment. I don't know. Yeah, it, it turns out, it, it may turn out 
um, and Buddhists claim that you can sort of speed up your apprehension of that process in your own case. Um, I mean, a, a quick example is that that sound is supposed to have to be composed of 64 mind moments. <laughs> and so can you, how many can you catch? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So now the claim in the tradition is that people are like, no, really, like, how many? <laughs> and, and where that becomes interesting is when somebody insults you or um, claims that you stole something. That's a big one. Um, a false accusation is, a, is an example that's given, um, it's meditated on quite a bit in the Gelukpa tradition in Tibetan Buddhism. That instantaneous reaction, that's possibly the most vivid sense of self you can have, or it's among that category of like, whoa, urgent kind of sense of self, and that's the one that you sort of like really think about. Uh -huh. and, and then when, when you've done that a lot and habituated to the level of swasambhidana, then your capacity to respond ethically in those situations is empowered. Hmm. Yeah, it made me think, Laura, that the brain is kind of like a divination engine. Well, obviously that's where I'm headed. Yeah. <laughs> My brain is a tarot deck. I had an x-ray <laughs> once. And what yeah. consciousness is, is so, so the, our, our habits, our perceptual habits, um, are largely unconscious, and the brain is constantly predicting what's going to happen next. Consciousness usually comes online when something unexpected or surprising happens that doesn't fit with our expectations. Right, and that's where um, we learn yeah. new habits, yeah. right? Because something new happens that we can't, that our brain can't automatically assimilate to what it already knows and what it was expecting. It's also equilibrium. Yeah, yeah, but thank goodness the brain is so good at divining what happens next. Because if we had to be conscious of every little thing that we do, we'd have no room left at all. We would just be like gods on acid in space. It would just <laughs> yeah. be like a rainbow puddle of, of <laughs> just wonder. It would be so sparkly, we wouldn't know what to do with ourselves. Yeah. How are we doing? Well, okay, yeah, you tell us, Deepa. Yeah. Well, thank you, and the more of these talks is very interesting. Um, our next one is in uh, two hours. Oh, yeah? Oh, three hours. Oh. By the fire, you mean? Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you brought the more, I, I felt that you brought a humanistic perception or a humanistic angle to consciousness, what is human consciousness. And I was considering or wondering about Sri Aurobindo's view on consciousness, where the consciousness was involuted in the universe mm -hmm. and now it's being evolved right. out, mm -hmm. you know, so it's much bigger mm -hmm. than human and we are just tapping into that consciousness. Right. Right. Whether it's super mind of Sri Aurobindo or Ella Vidal of uh, Bergson. So, what is, can you link that perspective, or is it a completely different case? Well, I think part of what I was describing with the way that, um, <coughs> oh, sorry, I'm just conscious that we kind of need to wrap it up. Okay. But go ahead, give us, give last, us a sense. Last comment. The idea that consciousness is, has a horizontal structure, and that ultimately its, it's true nature is intersubjective, it's where those, what's on the other side of the horizon of each of our conscious experiences is another consciousness. Uh, and so, really, consciousness is this in-between space. And um, that consciousness is the in-between space, it's, it kind of suggests to me that um, pure space is uh, pure consciousness, and that our physiology, our nervous systems, our brains are kind of filters for that pure consciousness that um, slow down that, that purity to a level that we can actually experience finite, particular, uh, colored, textured um, separation, right? Apparent separation. And that maybe the evolutionary process that Sri Aurobindo is describing is um, part of a, a grand cycle of the return to that pure, undifferentiated space, luminous consciousness, uh, and a, a, an, an evolutionary process to a highly differentiated state uh, of consciousness, which, you know, it's just a game that Brahman is playing with, with itself. Um, you know, that's, that's a fascinating perspective to take. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't always orient myself in that place, but it's, it's a pretty profound perspective. 
Yeah. It, uh, it seems to me that the question that engages is, and your, your response, but it does have implications in terms of our, our behavior, our approach to humanity, our approach to one another. If in fact we are simply the particularities of something that's much bigger, uh, with an eventual, perhaps, cosmological return of some kind, but that there's something about that, that, that what to do about it has a lot to do with our participation in community, for example, and so forth. Right. So rather than consciousness being a hard problem, it's more like an ethical opportunity to discover a new way of relating yeah, to each other. Yeah, Yeah. I think I, we should... We, yeah. Yeah, we should That's take it offline now. Nice to spend this time together. Yeah.